Okay, I'm making this video. Hi, internet! I'm back! Did you miss me? Don't answer that if you're mean. I certainly miss you guys. It's been a few months since I've been on YouTube. Longest break I've ever taken, but it was uh, very much needed and I feel so good. I think the social media detox is very nice. So I wanted to fill you all in on some stuff that's been going on since I've been on break. I haven't been completely removed from the internet. If you are active in the conversation about feminism and social justice warriors, you may have noticed that I've been talking to and hanging out with some anti-feminist YouTubers. This has apparently really confused people. There have been thousands of tweets and emails and people freaking out, like what is going on? After all, I, Lacey Green, am the very pinnacle of a social justice warrior. My SJW-ness has been memefied with statements like, everything is problematic and there are more than two genders and America is racist. But now, at pro-Trump rallies, I'm told by reliable sources, there's talk that I'm being red-pilled in the Matrix sense, not so much the pickup artist sense. The red pill is a meme that refers to this realization that the world isn't nearly as simple as you thought it was. The question, of course, is what is the truth? What is the, what truth? Is the truth? And how bad do you want to know? In some sense, I took the red pill a long time ago. It's why I do what I do. My YouTube stuff has always been about the pursuit of forbidden knowledge. And while yes, I am a feminist, I wouldn't describe myself as the ideologue that people sometimes make me out to be. I feel that things tend to be messier than that. And frankly, that's the way I like it. So let's get messy. So here's some context about me. I used to be Mormon, pretty intensely so. You know, when I was 12 years old, there were adults telling me that my spiritual destiny is to be perpetually pregnant. Cute, right? I'm also half Iranian. Funny enough, my grandparents were political rebels in their day, speaking truth to power during the revolution in 1979. It's actually pretty badass and it makes me feel like rebellion runs in my blood. But as a teenager, I got a little bit lost in all of this, as you do. So my first YouTube channel that I started when I was 17 was about skepticism and philosophy. Then when I was 19, I created a series called Sex Plus, which is dedicated to helping young people who, like me, had been told that their sexuality was bad or wrong, that they're less than because of their gender or sexual orientation, and so forth. So this is the type of stuff that forms the core of my feminism, which I would describe as intersectional, sex positive, and skeptical. Skeptical, as in not easily convinced of stuff. Science is my rubric wherever possible because we're all prone to human error. Science isn't perfect, but it helps reduce those errors by a lot. At the end of the day, we all have true beliefs and we all have false beliefs. Skepticism is about acknowledging that. It's questioning even the seemingly unquestionable and being willing to adjust our beliefs as we get new information. In truth, I want to engage with criticism, but it's really hard to do online. There's a lot of hostility, things escalate super quickly, people don't really seem to be listening to each other, it's just a shit show. So I went down the rabbit hole of anti-SJW videos, and I found that some are pretty disrespectful. But that's not all the channels. I've recently found anti-SJW channels that are well-cited and reasoned, you know, make some interesting points. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, I agree with that, or huh, I didn't really think of that. And sometimes I disagree, in which case, you know, I still feel it's beneficial for me to listen and consider another perspective. It helps me learn. So I decided to reach out to some. And, you know, I was pleasantly surprised. People have been pretty kind to me. And, you know, I'll be honest, they didn't really expect that. No judgment, no vitriol. I even feel like I have a really good connection with a couple of new friends. But not everyone is so hunky-dory about it. Um, good friends of mine, feminists, have been a little bit skeptical of me. They express the opinion that talking to antis or problematic people is, you know, not gonna be worth the time, that it won't be fruitful that I'm engaging with bigots and validating the perspectives, that I'm offering a platform to bullies, things like that. While I can appreciate this perspective, I fundamentally disagree with it. So let me go down another rabbit hole here. Social justice communities lately have been arguing that bigoted ideas, you know, this, this harmful speech 
should be suppressed because it allows the bigotry to spread and to be validated. I'm thinking of campaigns to get people's Twitters banned, you know, book deals canceled, talks canceled, things like that. Ironically, this sounds very similar to the logic that is used by the right to censor sex ed. Information about sex has been deemed too harmful to hear. It'll encourage immoral behavior and speed social decay. Two sides of the same coin. The question is, what counts as harm? To some, harm is a problematic opinion. Harm is hate speech. Harm is inciting violence. The other pole of this issue is the perspective that there is no such thing as harmful speech that speech can't hurt you. Therefore, all speech should be permitted, no matter what. I fall somewhere between these two perspectives. My opinion is that speech can be emotionally harmful if it causes pain or shame or dehumanizes you. It can also be physically harmful if it incites or advocates violence against someone. But these two harms don't pose the same amount of threat to an individual in the context of political speech. So they shouldn't be treated as equal forms of violence. You know, if we're gonna say a slur is just as violent as punching someone in the face, to me, that minimizes the egregiousness of punching someone in the face. So I tend to agree with the interpretation by a lot of human rights organizations, which is that harmful speech starts where it incites or advocates violence. You know, I think the definition of harm is being pushed too far in regard to political speech, that this heightened level of sensitivity is actually resulting in some censorship. Not de jour, like government censorship, the technical definition of it, but de facto censorship, you know, in practice. By shutting down platforms for speech and driving it underground, or by making ideas too taboo to be allowed to talk about. I also feel like this approach doesn't very well promote social justice. For one thing, when you think about it, Suppression of speech is just a band-aid. It doesn't really address the systemic inequality or the mentality that lies at the root of these problems. It just sort of shuts the conversation down. It also has a clear backfire effect. It makes those poor, censored voices more sympathetic to a moderate audience. You know, case in point, Milo Yiannopoulos. The way I see it, the internet already gives everyone a huge platform, you know, much bigger than a university can offer. They're already on the internet. They're gonna be there. We should talk about it. I think we should address things head on. Through open dialogue, we can parse out ideas and really see what they're made of. And in response, everyone else has free speech too. They can dissent, they can protest, they can ask critical questions, they can counter the narrative, they can, uh, you know, highlight fallacies and moral failings of the argument. So all of this comes to a head in a brutally bizarre spectacle that happened last week amongst feminist scholars who appear to be cannibalizing themselves as usual. It all started with a feminist philosopher's publication in the philosophy journal Hypatia about transracialism. So in the paper, she examines arguments that are used for transgender equality and basically finds that that logic can be applied to race as well. She highlights some of the logical inconsistencies and weaknesses in the arguments that are used against someone like Rachel Dolezal. It's a controversial topic and a controversial conclusion. And you know, she may well have some things wrong, but instead of refuting her arguments on their logical merits, the academics penned an open letter uh, claiming that the paper needs to be revoked, citing its various harms, including you know, using the wrong word, um, degrading trans people by comparing them to Dolezal. And having read the paper, the accusations that are made in this open letter are a complete misrepresentation of her argument to an extreme degree, which really makes this whole ordeal all the more troubling. These are not grounds to censor an academic paper. They're not grounds to ruin someone's uh, academic reputation. I mean, what's the end goal here? Is it that, you know, only a very specific perspective can be heard in a philosophy journal exploring feminisms? Like that strikes me as very contradictory. And more generally, should publications, you know, reject papers that don't agree with majority opinion? Like that makes no sense. So this is a pretty big concern of mine. And you know, I felt this way for a long time. It affects my work. It affects my the way that I can interact with people, the things I can talk about, the people I can talk to. And this is not to say that censorship doesn't occur on the right, because it absolutely does. They just tend to censor different issues. So where does this leave us? I want to continue these conversations, which is why soon I'm going to be launching a series of live debates 
with feminists and anti-feminists. So in the comments, let me know if you have an idea of someone that I should invite on, or if you have ideas of topics that we should debate. And as for that red pill, well, <laughs>